Hello again, folks. This is the concluding part of Italy week. And what a week it's been. If you were with me yesterday with Drag and Alex and Giulio for the Italian Navy show, that was now my most popular show ever in terms of views within 24 hours. So that's kind of exciting little um, step forward for World War II TV because we're still not breaking into the big numbers of views. But yeah, Lesterdays was, was fantastic. So um, that was good. So um, we're continuing and finishing tonight with a good old battlefield study. We're looking at the town of Medicina, and joining me tonight is a battlefield guy, Julian Whippy, or Jules, I'll call him. Good evening, Jules. How are you doing? Hi. Hi, Paul. Yeah, I'm good. Ready to go. And it, it, it's always good to have a battlefield guide explain a battle because we, you know how to do it. We know how to do it. It's, uh, well, let's it's, hope so. <laughs> let's hope so. So, um, and I should remind people, Julian has got – a tour to Italy coming up in October with Battle Honours Tours. There's links to his company in the description below. So um, although things are still a bit up in the air in terms of guiding in some places, there is there is going to be a season later in the year. So details of that. So you can have Jules' expertise uh, actually on the ground in Italy, which would be really nice. So, um, yeah. So where are we? Where are we going to today? Well, we're going to Medicina, and I'm going to hand over to Jules to um to kind of explain where we're going to go. And as usual, folks, I will jump in with comments and questions from you guys. And um, so um, well, with, without further ado, um, I'll hand over to Jules. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's quite good to finish where we are at um, where we're going to anyway at Medicina because it's kind of like in the last what six weeks before um, the end of the war uh last four weeks before the end of the war and so uh, a good a place as any to conclude and um i noticed a, a couple of people had commented on twitter about the picture that we've started with there paul and just asking what it was so before we go anywhere else yes an, an unfrocked priest they call it which is basically uh, a 105 gun with the the gun taken off allowing that guy to just um have a, a 50 cal and to ca carry troops on board so an early armored personnel carrier but we'll we'll talk more about them um as we go through okay next one let's go paul let's talk about uh, a little little overview before we zoom in right on to medicina which is towards the north near bologna just a little bit of a recap for you i know you've all had italy week um but just like we do on all tours we should sort of like what we call is it zoom out and zoom in to give you an overview of what we're looking at and why and so it's very it's a bit daft to just try and say right here's the battle of medicina and you you might not know fully exactly where we are in the world and i think a battlefield guide fails miserably if the first thing he says to you after you've done your stand is so where's the enemy and where are we stood you know you need to get all that through through your mind so we're in italy for the battlefield tour but let's just do a little recap on, on what goes on uh, of course before the battle of um, medicina takes place in 1945 the sort of uh you know, the, the seeds of it are sown by uh, the Casablanca Conference way back in January of 1943, when uh, George Marshall, uh, American George Marshall, sort of outvoted and outmaneuvered at the conference uh, by the British officers present uh, when they convince him and everybody else involved to continue their strategy of what they called indirect approach, which was beating or at least taking the war to, to Germany via other locations uh, if that was in the first world war the great war would have been calling it an easterners approach rather than the western front mm -hmm. so it would keep fighting um having having defeated the africa corps um in in north africa it was about how we continue to push uh towards germany and austria uh, and the, the British said, well, we're not ready to do uh, battle on the beaches of France or, or as it would end up being D-Day in Normandy. We're not ready for that, but we can continue on, on a certain scale. And they wanted to do it in the Mediterranean and keep fighting. And so they commit to pushing into Italy via Sicily. Um, Rommel, on his uh, one of his last um, meetings with Hitler at the end of the Tunis uh, campaign, the the African campaign, says, uh, is it going to be Tripoli you want or is it the Africa Corps? And Hitler um, replies to him that, that the Deutsche Africa Corps does not matter. And you can imagine Rommel's reaction to that. And uh, he, he followed that up by saying, you know, we're going to defend Germany through uh, 
through Italy's front door, not the Sicilian parlor. So, um, you know, it was all there, always their sort of push from a German perspective was to, to keep uh, the Allies away from Germany as far as they could. And to, that's why basically they said, you know, there's no pulling back, there's no falling back. We need to keep them as far away as we can. But of course, we do invade and we invade to Sicily in July 1943. Um, and I'm sure that you've probably done some shows on that, Paul, before, have you? We haven't Fascinating. Done yet. No, we haven't. Right. We haven't touched this um, uh, Future, yeah. Future, future. Oh, great. Well, you know, I might be able to do something for you there. It's a superb um, sort of miniature campaign to do. And, of course, if anyone wants to go to Sicily just on holiday and, and drag along their other half, it's a, it's a great place to go on holiday. And at the same time, you're never far away from battlefields. But... I would, I would weather that by just saying, be careful how, how big Sicily actually is. It can catch you out. It's not. And the driving, map. the drivers. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm absolutely mad. If, if yeah. I, I, I was there with Mag three years, four years ago, and it had been planned for me to do the driving, and I'm a bit of a cautious driver. If it had been me driving, I'd still be there. So Mag took over yeah. with her <laughs> French thing, and she just got, because it was crazy over there. I mean, brilliant. Yeah. But wow. Yeah. Good place to visit. So, yeah, they attacked. Uh, Sicily short campaign but it's got it all naval air action a lot of the characters involved in 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 the campaigns there um it's a successful European campaign for uh, the, the Allies and they cross over through the Straits of Messina they land at Salerno and they keep pushing up Lots of people uh, after after this these these events that have led up to the Salerno landings etc have often said well perhaps the Allies made a mistake here straight away question because by committing to attack the it italian boot if you like through its toe and its heel you are there you're therefore committed to slogging your way up all the way to the top of the boot um other people have suggested afterwards that maybe if they'd have attacked sardinia first they could have cut across to rome um, and, and basically isolated and uh, cut off a lot of the Germans that were in Italy uh, and saved himself a great deal of time. But let's look at what that's sort of counterfactual stuff. Yeah. They, do, they, they do attack through the, through the toe and the heel, and then they push up through, um, through to the, the famous battles of Casino on the Gustav line, and they keep slogging their way up. Uh, towards the Gothic line, and of course we'll get talk more about that. They land at Anzio, just south of Rome, and then they push on to the Gothic line, and then finally, uh, after the battles, which we'll talk about more now, um, they they break out into the Po Valley, and that's really pretty much the end of the war. So the last little red square that we've just put on at Bologna, that's that's where we'll be focusing on for the next part of the evening. Thank you. Much uh, is talked about by these lines across uh, Italy, and these uh, it's, it's a very sensible thing to do. It's a superb uh, defensive country, if you like. Rivers, mountains, uh, narrow valleys, you know, it's all a, a defender's dream. And we know that by this stage in the war, and in fact, probably by the start of the war anyway, the Germans is, is a very capable, very well-equipped a motivated and driven uh, soldier, and when given the task of defending these areas, that they, they they were supremely capable um, and, and well equipped in in doing that. And so they they created these lines, um, the Gustav line, Barbara, the switch lines, and so forth. Um, many of them, too many to mention, but of course, a lot of them were were dug and defended um, and dug and created, I should say, by um, the forced labour uh, organisations, tot and 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 lo local prisoners and partisans that had been rounded up, etc., were were forced to do it. So not not mostly dug by German soldiers, but nevertheless, that's what they did, and and that is a feature of this campaign. So move on up to the terrain itself in Italy is um, the terrain and the weather. They're the two things that we'll mention. Um, looking at the guys on the right in the picture, they're very, very typical. That actually could be um, Africa in 1941. You know, these guys look the same. They're bronzed. They've got their short trousers on. Um, it can get incredibly stifling, stiflingly hot, as they found out in, in the height of the Sicily um, part of the campaign. And that was to continue. 
Uh, it can be stiflingly hot there, and then in the winter, it can be cripplingly cold. And of course, uh, to deal with the uh, weather, you've also, uh, to, to make the weather worse, you've got the terrain in Italy, which had been unlike um, anything else in, in that we were going to face in Western Europe. Um, you know, incredibly high peaks, the Apennines, uh, the sort of spine of Italy that, that runs all the way down, series of mountains and passes that I don't know how high they go, but they certainly get snow capped and uh, they're a lot, are often shrouded in fog and mist. And uh, really, really difficult to, to, to get an army up um, and over those uh, locations. So it's going to be um, a, a whole campaign that is uh, punctuated with, with, with weather and with terrain. And, and both of those are going to take their toll on the... Um, on the Allied forces. And we should point out, and it's come up in the other shows this week, is it not only was the, would the weather have been bad anyway, it was the worst wind of the 20th century. So the rivers are wider and flooded and faster moving. There's more mud, yeah. there's more snow, there's more ice. Everything is compounded and made worse uh, by that, that randomness of it being a particularly bad week. Yeah. Bad. Yeah. yeah. What the 43, 40 into 44 was a particularly bad one. Right. Yeah. I knew it'd been very wet and, um, this is the, the, the feature that's worth spending a, just a moment on as, as a real, uh, underlying part of the Italian campaign is, uh, bridging, uh, the, uh, the amount of bridges that the, the, the engineers of both, um, the Americans and the, and the British, uh, contingents had to build was absolutely phenomenal. Um, all sorts of wide ones. The, wi the widest one was the Sangro River um, that they had to um, build a Bailey Bridge across. What an invention. Um, and by the end of the campaign, we'd built 2,800 bridges in Italy. And in the rest of the world, uh, the Allies built 2,000 more. So we bought more, more we built wow. more bridges more bridges in Italy in one campaign than the rest of the Pacific and the uh, Northwest Europe campaign um, combined. A total of 45 miles of Bailey Bridge laid end to end. Um, you know, so if you can imagine how much sort of hardware is involved, those sappers were incredibly busy. They had to repair bridges that, um, you know, sort of on the sides of mountains where they'd collapsed whole roadways. So the engineering stuff that goes into the Italian campaign is is a, is at different level. It really is sort of leveled up. Um, and um, the bottom right picture there is one of those ingenious things. That's the known as the arc. I think you're you're very much a vehicle man, aren't you, Paul? Mm, and yeah, um, yeah. there's actually a sort of double decker arc system, which has got the, the the old Churchill tank on the bottom and then it's got another Churchill on the top of that without the, and then it's got the folding, um, folding, uh, parts of it that make the bridge and then another Churchill driving out over the top of it. Incredible engineering, Avrays and all that. They're all going to play their part. So weather, terrain and, uh, engineering are massive parts of this, um, of the Italian campaign. And of course, whilst they are working hard and dealing with the weather, we've got the uh, the criticism um, from from many quarters summed up by the uh, Nancy Astor, who came out allegedly with with the quote, "We are the D-Day uh, that they the, they were D-Day Dodgers." Um, obviously, I would imagine she she came up with that slightly after D-Day itself. Uh, while the campaign had already been going on for the best part of a year, that passed her by. Um, Nancy Astor, American-born, uh, but voted into Parliament, I do believe. Um, not sure what constituency or how that came to pass. No, first, first female member of Parliament, I think, wasn't she? Or That's second. right. Yeah, yeah first yeah. female. Yeah, yeah. Um, what a surprise, a politician making an insensitive remark that didn't go down with everybody. I mean, that's never happened before or since, has it? I mean, since. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I, love the, I love the quote where she, because um, I certainly read only, only recently when I was prepping up for the show, I read a bit more about her and, and how she came to say it. And one of the things apparently that said of her was that she was pretty anti-Semitic. And uh, she also didn't like Churchill because he drank and was too sort of uh, too raucous for her. She being a teetotal, and she allegedly said to Churchill, um, "If I was your husband, I would lace your drink with poison." And he said, "And if I was your husband, I'd probably drink, drink it quickly." <laughs> yeah. It's, so uh, um, those 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 stories about her are, are allegedly aren't there, and it's and yeah. it's so uh, it's such an unfounded comment. 
about somehow that campaign being less important. And yes. I think also worth mentioning, I mean, you probably were going to mention it anyways, unlike Normandy, where the majority of troops landing have had been training for two years. There are a few veteran units. Most yeah. of the units in Italy have been slugging their way through North Africa and Sicily and Tunisia yeah. and haven't been home in, in yeah. however long. So right. and by right. 45, yeah. you're just getting fatigue, mental fatigue, weary, just when will this slogging campaign end? So and, I think that factor yeah. comes into it as well. I would um I, I didn't I didn't get round to kind of putting any of the um the other uh words for the song on there but i would urge anyone watching tonight to 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 um to go and look up various um copies of the song and, and on youtube and what have you she you know it's, it's it's great and you it's i think it's to the tune of lily marlene isn't it, it is, one of yeah, those yeah, and yeah. um it mentions sangro river and the americans and all sorts of things so yeah so they're getting criticism. I love the uh, the picture on the right with their umbrella up, though. Um, and I'm sure Gareth would say these are cavalry, but if you notice, it actually says uh, Frascati on the uh, mm. on the uh, on on the. So they've given their name to it. Um, but yeah, so it, it, it's a campaign that deserves far more attention. And uh, those uh, veterans, I met a few that are Italy star veterans, you know, they, they deserve to be as spoken to and, and put on pedestals as much as anyone that landed in Northwest Europe, um, you know, or in, in, after D-Day. So it's a hell of a campaign. And um, as you've seen already, you know, the weather, the terrain and, and the bridging and the slogging nature of it all the way up there takes its toll, a big toll. Um, and so this was a diversion, really, those sort of D-Day Dodger accusations. So having, um, we, we, we've, we've pretty much, as uh, as promised, I'm not going to mention Casino once more because that's going to be an, a subject for you to, to talk about. But that's the only other battle that most people have heard about, really, in Italy. Um, and so we're, we're bouncing past that towards the north. So after June and the, the fall of Casino, the fall of Rome and everything that that entails sort of politically and, and posturing by the generals, they then continue the slog up and they reach uh, Florence. Now, this is the uh, the Gothic line, the famous line that runs uh, east, pretty much east to west uh, from um, uh, Pisa in on the west side with the Leaning Tower. Uh, just around Florence, both sides had agreed after, I think one of the generals made a, a declaration, I can't remember who it was, uh, that said that there shouldn't be any fighting. They, they said it's such a beautiful city. It was kind of declared, um, was it open city? One of open those city, expressions. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, but the line itself continued along uh, 2,000 pillboxes, bunkers, etc., built across uh, Italy, just in that line alone. Um, and it has the um, the passes, the footer pass. It has all these other things that, um, you know, it it's virtually impenetrable. If you shut the roads, you can virtually not get up there, um, let alone start covering it with mortar fire, 88s, MG42, bouncing Betty, um, shoe mines, you name it, um, and miles of barbed wire. Germans occupied all of the high ground, so they had superb observation. It's, it's an incredibly strong defensive position on the Gothic line. And um, it's, it's attacked in late August um, by the, the British on the right. And in some places, the Gothic line is penetrated um, fairly quickly, in others less so. So rather than say um, for tonight, you know, it was all breached at the same time. It's not because a few things start to then um, slow the proceedings down. One of them, we've already mentioned, the weather starts to close in in the in the hills of those Apennine Mountains. You know, you don't have to get much further than probably October and it's already freezing at, freezing at night and you're getting the heavy rains and then, of course, frosts and then the snow starts to come in and uh, general weather starts to put the handbrake on the whole of the uh, offensive. At the same time, uh, troops from both sides, the Germans and the Allies, are being withdrawn because of uh, the fighting in, in uh, France and up into what was, you know, Belgium and, and Holland going on at the same time. So both sides lose a few troops to that, kind of loses a bit of momentum, the whole, the whole campaign, and there's a little bit of stagnation and not a lot goes on between December 
and January, and January, February, really. It's um, it's all too cold, too too stagnated, snow on the ground, etc. So we'll move up the hill, if you like, and we'll see what's going on on a wider scale. Just by zooming out here, you've got um, the old Gothic line on there, which is largely breached then in, in uh, sort of February, March time. We're looking at now the next phase. Um, the large coat of arms is 15th Army Group with the, like the waves on it. Then on the left, you've got the American 5th Army and on the right, uh, and the British 8th Army, of course, famous for being out in the desert. So that's pretty much how they've uh, progressed up Italy all of the way. The Americans large, largely on the left and the British forces and the Canadian armies with uh, attached Polish troops, etc., They've been with us on on the right hand side, and the the the, the line, if you like, uh, down the middle has has varied enormously according to the tasks. So according to tasks, the fifteenth army would have moved some Brits over to help the Americans. Sometimes they came over and helped and took a bit of ground from us. So it's not a strict divide in line, but that's pretty much where they were. I'm no expert on the Yugoslavian Tito. Nobody um, is. <laughs> yeah, no. nobody is. It's a <laughs> nobody tough, is. tough one to understand, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's why I've just used PowerPoint's lovely big blue line to say roughly here by um, sort of like February and March 1945. Um, the reason I, it, it, you have to mention it is that, you know, you have to remember that this is, this is although this is a campaign that is just going on in Italy, the the war's going on everywhere else as well. You know, by, by March 1945, just think of the, the magnitude of things going on on the Eastern Front, what the Germans are facing there, mm. um, you know, as uh, as the Russians are closing in. The the, the, the Brits are, and the Americans are also about to have um, varsity and cross the Rhine. And just over here, the Italian Front is still being fought. So although they're, they're isolated, that they're not if you like. You have to understand yeah. that the Yugoslavian forces that um, were being um, looked after, if you like, or at least supported heavily by the 15th Army Group and by General Alexander, who was told to supply them with weapons, uh, because all the time that the Yugoslavian uh, troops are, are, are in action over on, the, on that front, it's helping 15th Army Group. They're tying down more and more Germans, just like the main event for for the Italian front is that we tie down, you know, we being the allies, tie down as many of the German forces as we can, uh, allowing the, the, the main enemy in, in France and Belgium. The Germans at this point, uh, is, is they're trying to keep multiple plates spinning. And if they, yeah, yeah. And if, if they try and focus a bit on Yugoslavia, it maybe weakens Italian front a bit. If they weaken, if they focus Italy, it weakens Yugoslavia. There's other stuff happening in Normandy and Belgium and France as well. So they're, they're struggling on all fronts. And even when you talk about the American fifth arm and the eighth army, if they put a bit of resources to counter the British, then it gives the Americans a bit of a head start in their bit. So it kind yeah. of yo-yos back and forth a bit as they as as they exploit each other because the Germans are running out of people, running out of fuel, running out of everything at this point. So that continued pressure is, after all, what Eisenhower wanted, isn't it? In a broad sense, is, yeah. is keep keep that pressure on from every angle, and and we'll break them. I, and, I, and, I, and to be fair to uh, the Germans at this stage, you know, they, they are masters at, um, uh, at the fire brigade um, yeah. approach to this. Uh, you know, they're famous for doing it more so on the Eastern Front, uh, where they move the SS units or, or whoever they need very quickly to, to put down another attack, then move them anywhere else. But they, they were doing that on a wider front, and it wasn't unheard of for troops literally to be moved from the Eastern Front to Italy and then to Yugoslavia or Greece. Mm -hmm. um, so incredibly, you know, logistically, you know, and, and the air power that is arrayed against them, and this is the only thing I was going to finish off on this Yugoslavian slide, is they were asking for more and more air power to assist them um, and, and, and heavy tanks and heavy guns. And, and Alexander was almost sort of ticking these things off that, yes, he was going to give them, but the, the politicians in London said, um, you know, it, that's not going to happen. There, there, there was, there was thing, there was moves afoot higher up than even army commander politically to say, not sure that this Tito guy and the partisans are necessarily, you know, the people that we're going to be siding with in a few weeks' time. It was, well, um, well, Damien Lewis brought this up two days ago. The same things happening really? in Italy. We've, we've been, ha we've, the Allies have been happy to put resources into these partisan local operations when there was an absolute priority to get the war won. But now 
piece is kind of inside. It's not inside for the poor guys we're mm. talking about later in the battle, but in the in the broader sense, it's like yeah, let's let's back off. Uh, our supply yeah. of arms. I mean, Damien made that point, Italian partisans in the area north of where we're talking about, they hadn't had supply drops between September and March. Uh, so for September 44 to March 45, March. no supply yeah. drops. And it's all because, hang on, we're giving uh, weapons to essentially communists or or people we think might be communists. And exactly the same thing's happening in Yugoslavia. So yeah, I, I hate it that I, in my in a sense that politics is now being considered by those at the higher higher end. I mean, if you're in the Gurkha Rifles or you're part of the yeah. Remedies on the ground, you don't give a shit about what's happening in the in the doesn't post war doesn't, era. Doesn't cross but, your mind. But the yeah. chess game, the chess game is afoot. Yes. That's the thing that uh, the, the 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 post war map of Europe is already being shaped. So yeah, and, and of course it's to go down there. But yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure your your viewers, you know, um, will will know more of these examples than me. But you know, let's let's look at Afghanistan and the Mujahideen in in you know the 1980s with the Russians, who then turn out to be enemies of America and you know battle yeah. against terror, and they're using American Stinger missiles given to them years before. You know, it comes around. Um, yeah. But getting back to Yugoslavia, Zadar or Zadar, um, just near the Dalmatian coast. Um, yeah, we send over numerous squadrons of Spitfires. Um, there's some Mustangs, there's some Yugoslavian squadrons, and then there's also some uh, two squadrons of Hurricanes, rocket fire and Hurricanes, or that which they call fighter bombers. So you know, there's a lot of help going on in Yugoslavia. It's really helping them um, push their way up to towards Trieste, which was their ultimate objective, and again, put pinning them down. So. Um, we're getting closer to the battle. Yeah, here we are. So what we've got here, um, Medicina, thank you, Paul, um, which we'll talk about as a medieval large village come small town um, of, of, of very little consequence that most people in Italy have never heard of, let alone in the UK. Um, and it ends over and en ends up being fought over in 1945 in, in a short, sharp battle on the 16th of April. Um, just like most of the small towns and villages that are on on this map, you know, they they all have a story to tell. Um, and it's whether the, the battle passed through them or or didn't. Um, and that's what's added to on the battlefield. The other part of this map that um, you can perhaps point out, it's, it's entitled the Argenta Gap. Argenta is just to the west side of Lake Camacho. Yeah, you've got it there. Uh, Lake Camacho was seen uh, by the Germans as a defensive position in that they could flood the low-lying plains. Now, we're not in the high mountains here. Um, we're down into a very fertile pretty flat um, river valley um, with numerous rivers running across it, most of which are running almost north to south across here. And so the Germans had flooded the area of Lake Camacho um, and it, 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 the Argenta Gap is literally, um, there's a road called Highway 16, which runs from Ravenna in the sort of bottom right corner of the map up towards Argenta. Um, and that was pretty much the gap. Either side of that, literally within a mile or so, was flooded. So that's what's known as the Argenta Gap. It was flooded either side of that. Um, that then gave us less of an axis. They, you know, the army have this go, no go thing where they'll look at a map and they'll say where we can operate and where we can't. Lake, Lake Camacho um, actually fell into the, what they call the slow go. The reason was we started using the LVTs, the landing vehicles tracked, the mm. first amphibious uh, use of these things in this theatre. I think they'd been used in the Pacific, which is where we we brought them over from. And the Brits had got hold of a load with um, 79th Armoured Division. Look back, look those, look those pictures up. I'm sure your people can do that. So yeah, we did a show about the Shell Estuary and and Buffalo. Oh, very and, similar. So yeah, um, that, that we, we've covered that. Everyone, everyone's. I think the view most of you will be familiar with that show. That was a couple of weeks ago in um, Tanks Week. We did that, the Shell Test Street, which was about the same time of, 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 of effectively, uh, yeah. yes, 
45 yes yeah. a- april yeah yeah, yeah. Um, so it's fascinating. It's using commandos and everything. So, the, so essentially, they're going to come up on the right flank um, and and um, use Lake Camacho. There's two Victoria crosses, one around that action there, um, and then um, lots of unusual armour being used. So great actions, really, you know, really good short, sharp actions, uh, ingenuity, um, and and battlefield advances being used by the Allies specifically. There, great infantry and armour cooperation is is going, you know, is really on a learn curve and it's steep and that but it, it's working very well yeah. by this stage so medicina there it is um we are advancing i keep saying we because i know i shouldn't do but the allies are advancing um and they are coming from on your map there they're almost going from right to left they're not going north south it's the it's the direction of access you thought they would have been but because of this terrain and all of these rivers the Naviglio Canal, the Senio River, the Santerno River, and then the Solero River. And each one of these, in, in a miniature way, was defended further by the Germans. So they knew that that's the way we were coming, and each one was a, a, a miniature stop line um, in itself. So uh, next slide, please, Paul. So who are the troops that we're going to talk about in the, in the forthcoming Battle of Medicina? Well, one of the major parts is is the Gurkhas. And I'm sure you've had a few programs. I saw you had one, was it Tim? Um, Tim Gurun, yeah. yeah. The, first, the first time a Gurkha, a real Gurkha, was invited on a channel to talk about Gurkha history. Lots of white historians are talking about Gurkhas, but I think I broke a bit of new ground there by having a Gurkha talk about Gurkha, which makes perfect sense to me. And he yeah, debunked long some energy. of the myths about the cookery and the things like that. Yeah. It was great great guy I've, I've i've watched it i've watched it and then i, I he, he debunked a few of the things i was I about to say so which is great sport, wasn't he really <laughs> so, yeah. yeah but yeah. i've i i am i had a short um bit of work that i did with security forces out in afghanistan and i worked with gurkhas from uh from nepal while i was there and so i've got a, a, a good affinity with them and i've ended up naming my dog after gurkhas um so <laughs> Uh, he is Gurkha, um, love, lovely fellas, and um, foolhardy, uh, not foolhardy, uh, hardy, um, uh, courageous, um, humorous, and tough. Um, and they are much in evidence in the Italian campaign. Um, here we've got them examining a uh, captured, I think it's a pack 40, uh, that they're trying to learn how to use there at the top there. Um, certainly not a six-pounder. Um, and so they, they, they were provided um, numerous battalions. Here they are crossing one of the many rivers in Italy. Um, and w- what they've done is they've created a um, what is essentially a battle group. Um, and um, on the next slide, what we'll see is, is how it's made up. And this was known as the 43rd Gurkha Brigade. Now, depending on which um, army war diary you read or book or source, it was known as the Gurkha Brigade, the Motorized Brigade, or in a lot of them, the Gurkha Lorried Brigade. Um, American viewers will probably be sort of saying, what's a lorry? Well, it's a truck. Um, So motorized, um, which is why I use the motorized one. So they called it a brigade. But if you look at it, there's three battalions of Gurkhas, the 2nd, 6th, 2nd, 8th, second tenth then there's two rtr so a regiment of tanks 14 20th hussars a second regiment of tanks and it's got uh, a field regiment of artillery i think they're 25 pounders and then our battery of a medium regiment uh, i think you might be able to help me out here paul five inch guns are they the medium regiments uh 5.5 is probably by then 5.5 yeah. that's yeah. it and then there's a medium regiment of royal artillery and it, when uh, I'm looking at your slides sorry we're doing right when you were saying this is kind of reminding me of the, of the old kind of german battle group of a year or two earlier well, isn't it? We're, we're, we're trying to we're now almost incorporating some of the stuff the germans have done uh, well you know because in italy totally. as gareth said on monday you can't deploy armored divisions in the same way you can in north africa for example you've got to yeah. kind of break them down into smaller units and work with a bit of everything because of that terrain issue you mentioned earlier and bridging and stuff it makes sense to have a little bit of that a little bit of this a little bit of that and you have a sort of self-contained as i say battle group where yeah the germans must be really annoyed with they didn't patent it so uh yeah <laughs> coming back to attack them with their own type of um tactic in a sense 
Yeah, I mean, I think they would call it a camp group, wouldn't they? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, but it's if you look at that, that's that's some brigade. That's that's almost an understrength division. There's actually yeah. a couple of units that are, that are not marked on there. There was another artillery unit on there for um, semi permanently, and there was also an understrength regiment. I think it was like two two batteries of Polish self-propelled guns which i would think would be on m10 wolverines one of those yeah, um like something like that um so a really potent thing it's motorized as well so they've got they've got trucks and basically it's um yeah it's a mechanized they call it a pursuit brigade um because they and they, these were formed specifically in in the winter those guys were put together in the winter of 43 into 44 because they they realized that they were going to be coming out of the mountains where it was a slow slog infantry battle um you know hand to hand stuff and they were going to be moving onto these wet plains uh towards the po valley and they were pretty certain that the germans would be a little bit more on the run um and we wanted to be able to keep up with them um you know as you always want to do you want to keep in contact with any enemy as they retreat it's and that makes their job so much harder as a retreating soldier if the enemy are right up your backside so that's why these units were formed and they're very much you know a mobile brigade a pursuit brigade the americans now might call it a striker brigade you know yeah. um and it's also and, uh, it's also we've we've got the supply now. The British we finally after years of struggling to put enough trucks and guns and tanks in the field, we're actually doing all right now. You know, we we yeah. we so you know we can afford to a lot right. lorries to transport infantry. We didn't have any lorries spare a year or a year earlier. And you don't if you've got a lorry unit, you don't have to use the lorries, but they're a nice no. thing to have if you say if the Germans then start retreating faster, you need to move. You've got that mobility that had been hampering yeah. us in earlier in the war. So yeah, it's it's yeah. it's everything we've been learning so far. As you said earlier, we're we're peaking now. We have peaked. We are peaking. Everything we're the infantry tank cooperation, all those things that have gone through some really big teething problems are now getting to the point where we're 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 more almost mastering them. I would argue. Uh, yeah, I I totally agree. We're definitely we're getting a lot right. Thank you. Um, and and then the last thing to, to to prove that point even further is is these armored personnel carriers which are which are now coming into the battlefield. Um, so you've got on the top right there, um, you've got the the kangaroo, which essentially was a, a Sherman tank with its turret taken off, with a gun out and, and some of its um, gubbins inside removed, if you like, and 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 as much room made for carrying infantry. Um, great bit of kit um yeah. they they maintained i think the bow gunner and that one there that's like the first slide we had with the with the artist's impression that's your yeah. um that's one of your self-propelled guns and you can actually see the uh the 50 cal um hanging off the front on the other side yeah. um i think the kangaroos could take 10 um numerous sources argue about how many were on it but i think you'll see there's more than 10 in on that priest there but if if you if you want to know roughly if you think about 10 soldiers that could dismount from that then um that's more than most armored fighting vehicles today you know your boxer your warrior they might carry six seven and if they're lucky eight and it's all a squeeze and they they all complain about how long they take to get in and out of and i'm sure in 1945 it was much the same um but what they also do is they, they keep their gun tanks as well and you've got one of them i think that's one of the 17 pounder versions there yeah. um just just as a reminder not saying they're the 14th 20th but what they've done is the 14th 20th hussars um were were given the message that they were going to be joining the gurkhas and they they'd fought with them uh, once or twice before in some other actions and so they were really pleased they hadn't seen a great deal of action um the 14th 20th and when they were told that they were going to join the uh, gurkhas in this brigade they were very pleased um and um one of the things it meant was that they actually were going to lose some of their tanks to make these kangaroos but they were still pleased to be to be doing it because they knew that they'd be getting into the action and they were getting into the action with some good people that they could work mm. with so they converted a squadron uh entirely into kangaroos and then i think it was c and b squadron had a, a troop or two also uh, converted into kangaroos all the remaining tanks and regimental headquarters, etc., stayed with their standard Sherman uh, guns, be they 17-pounders or 75s. 
So what you've then got is the combination of the, the second, sixth Gurkha rifles and the 14th, 20th into a battle group within the 43rd Brigade. They are, you know, the armoured armored force ready to go. They're an armoured fighting vehicle force ready to go. You know, superb tactics. They're both able to support each other. The guns support the infantry. Of the, t the tanks support the infantry and the infantry can dismount and provide security and screening, especially in urban areas like Medicina. So that's what the 43rd Gurkha Lorried Brigade looks I like. I just want to briefly point out the tracks there on the, on the, on the show. Oh, yeah. It's got the, the, uh, the widened bits for better stability in, in mud and bogging down. I forget. It's called Platypus. something. It's, yeah. Platypus. Um, and that's just something you particularly see in that winter in that yeah. theatre. But I think you see them in Burma as well, in the, because of the the mud and stuff there. And it's you don't see them in Normandy very often, or Belgium or Netherlands, but you do see it no. there. It just gives that bit of uh, uh, spreads the weight better, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool, that good. So a little bit of a, a an overview of the whole situation here. Um, on our on our map, you can see if you can zoom in slightly on the on the right axis. Great, you've yep. got the second New Zealand division. Um, obviously, they'd fought at uh, Monte Cassino, so they're a battle-hardened Italian uh, campaign division. They're going to be attacking on the flank on the right of the 43rd Indian Brigade, Independent Brigade, and uh, to the left, not shown on this map, was going to be two Polish brigades. Now, the worry for the uh, command at this point was that Medicina was going to be a position that the Germans would attack north and south out of and attack into the flanks of the New Zealand troops to the north and to the Polish, Polish troops to the south. Mm. So they they well, saw the, it as the, a... Because the river valleys go kind of northwest, uh, yes. south, south, southwest, northeast. So yeah, yes. that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just so the they were, staggering numbers of uh, rivers and tributaries there. Crazy. Yeah, I know. And 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 when you get down on the ground um, and you actually see this ground, as I have done s several times, s most of those, actually, if you were driving them in a car, you wouldn't even know that you've just driven over them. They are very small. You know, they're almost like a drainage ditch. Yeah. Um, but, of course, they might have been slightly more prominent in the, in the 1940s. But most of them, not so much more. The, the one, the main one, the Senio, um, there's a, I came across in the official history a, a map. It's, yeah, it's probably just off that map there to the right. So we, we crossed that first. Um, it actually had very high riverbanks to stop it flooding out. Um, and the Germans had um, dug in into both sets of banks so that as you approach the, what would be the near bank, they, they were inside the riverbank with machine gun positions, OPs and everything. Then they had an escape tunnel that went out of the back of the riverbank onto a footbridge, just a narrow footbridge that would then cross the little river into the second bank, i.e., you know, the enemy side bank. And in that was storerooms, mortar positions and so forth. So the Senio was, was, was like a miniature Gothic line. And they mm. called down an army group and a, a um, army group artillery barrage on it, just just to pulverise it um, because it was it was so strong. So they also used ninety flamethrower tanks uh, on the Senio River. Um, they amassed the whole kind of core Eighth Army, um, the whole lot. They get wasps and they get the crocodile tanks. There's ninety of them lined up, and they flame the near side bank of the Senio to get them across. And that's after heavy and medium bomber raids have been used. You know, haven't mentioned it yet, and you really have to in the Italian campaign. This is t this is complex terrain against a tenacious, well dug in, armoured foe. It's really difficult to to make maximum use of of your own equipment without heavy losses, and it's air power time and time again that softens up. You know, with interdiction, uh, with close air support, and heavy bombers further back. Yes, this is probably air, air power in Italy is probably the major winner for for the Allies. It it plays a huge, huge part for them, and the Senio was that they 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 had heavy bomber raids um, just after they'd hit them with flamethrowers, you know, and it's just they pulverised their way forward. Um, British British still getting criticised. I've gone down a rabbit hole here, but fine. <laughs> British getting criticised for sort of some sometimes being slow, but they were using, you know, um, Clark, um, you know, they, they, they'd seen what happens in the First World War, in the Great War, 
and they knew that the war was coming to an end and they didn't want people to die. And they were saying, well, while we've got these endless st stacks of ammunition and aircraft, we're going to keep using them. And if it takes us another week, but we don't lose quite as many infantrymen, then that's what we're going to do. Whereas the Americans, a bit more gung-ho with less experience of the Great War, Mark Clark, etc., was like, let's go, let's go. And that 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 caused friction between the Americans and the and the Brits on the ground. Um, but yeah, British sort of stuff on uh, Medicina would 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 show that we were certainly in favour of using as much artillery as we could uh, every single uh, and air power uh, as we could every single yeah. time. So yeah, the forty third uh, brigade are, are tasked with taking Medicina because uh, it it posed a a possible porcupine, if you like, of defences. Uh, that they would debouch and attack the flanks of the attacking divisions. So 43rd, the Pursuit Brigade, they were tasked to get across the Silaro River on the 15th of, uh, of April and then get up to Medicina and uh, put pay to any defences inside. And who is going to be inside? Let's look at have a, have a look at who's there. So it's the 4th Parachute Division, Falsham Jaegers. Um, they were only formed uh, the year before, in November 1943, uh, from remnants of the 2nd Parachute Division. And two um, regiments, if you like, or about a brigade or so of Italian uh, paratroopers that had uh, come across and had been absorbed into them. And I think that the guys on the top right there are some of those Italian um, yeah. troops there. The uniform yeah, is, yeah, slightly different. Um, largely armed with um, with German equipment, but yeah, some of their stuff is is slightly different, so a bit easier to spot. So it was a combination of, uh, of German and Italians. So they did have the Pack Forty, they had, a, they had their uh, normal mortars, MP forties, MG forty twos, and uh, very few vehicles. An unusual vehicle on the bottom right there. They it's known as the Stug forty three, but anyone that knows their Stugs, and I am a Stug fan, will know that that's certainly not the normal Stug. It's an Italian Semaventi. Uh, uh, it's got a hundred and five millimeter gun. You've probably had that on Tank Week, have you? No, not that one. We'll do yeah. a Stug special at some point because I think they're they're an under uns well not unsung because they're from the baddies if you say, but they're an yeah. underappreciated um, contribution to the German war effort. It's always the Tiger Tank, isn't it? And uh, yeah. Oh. Stug, Stug is a very important um, um, kit, yeah. Match winner in, the, in many cases for the Germans. Yeah, I think the I think the German um, tank aces uh, were more, far more numerous in Stugs than they were in Tigers. Uh, but of course, they get all the they get all the attention. Yeah, yeah. so it's an Italian uh, designed piece of kit that's that's turned over to use. And so this is the Sturmgeschütz Abteilung um, that had a brigade um, battalion. Sorry. Um, of these, um, uh, certainly not a battalion in number. It was it was called that on paper, uh, but that that's the main um, armoured bit of kit that they've got. A number of these, um, they've lost some of their troops prior to the battle. They've been taken away uh, to, to to fight in other other areas. So it's not a full division, of course. It's an understrength element of the fourth parachute division. That's the enemy. Um, his name is. I, I wanted to make a mention of him. Uh, Tetna, um, he's the commander, and uh, he was the longest serving, uh, long and uh, uh, longest, latest living uh, Wehrmacht uh, officer. Didn't die until 1999, I think it was. He was 99 years old, but he was um, the First World War. He was in the Second World War and uh, Cold War Bundeswehr officer. Uh, fought all, all over the place, yeah. So he fought in the Cold War for the Western Allies. Uh, interesting, wow. interesting character. Um, so that's the defenders. So using a little bit of Google map stuff here, we can see um, the patchwork, uh, you know, fields that you get around the, this, this plane, very agricultural. <clears throat> and very little has changed. Um, it's it's a very unpopulated area. It's it's between Bologna and uh, Rimini. Um, just down the road is Faenza, Imola, very famous Ferrari. You know, so it's a fairly affluent part of Italy. But this this little section of it, you know, it's just little farms, little vineyards, uh, and and Medicina. You know, there's there's not a lot there, and you you'd blink and you'd miss it. Not overly attractive, but 
but not unattractive either. And I've, I've marked on there the Solario River. So this is the last river to cross before Medicina. It's only about uh, three miles from Solario to Medicina. Um, and that's the axis of advance um, in, in, in there. And that's where the parachute division are ensconced in and around it. So we, we're just going to show you the rough axis of advance. There's not too many surviving maps that show exactly the fields, but we've got the rough location of the river crossing. That's um, on the 15th of October. The first element to get across is the 2nd 10th Gurkha Rifles, part of the 43rd Mobile Brigade. On the 15th, they, they get across, but before they can actually allow the sappers to get to work putting a bridge behind them, they come under heavy mortar and artillery fire. Um, you know, astounding that we are literally weeks before the end of the war, and yet still the enemy is showing little sign in Italy of really being prepared to give up on any small scale. Um, heavy, heavy artillery and mortar fire brings down, and they have to walk, withdraw. So they cross it on the 15th, but they go back and seek shelter of the, uh, the home bank, if you like, on the eastern side, and they get behind the uh, embankment and wait for the cover of darkness. When that comes through, um, obviously after dark, they, they get back at it again uh, about 3 o'clock in the morning. The second tenth again go over. They create a bridgehead of defence around it. Germans not able to call down artillery fire so effectively. Sappers get busy and the bridge is thrown across. And by um, 4 o'clock in the morning, they're starting to put the bridge together. And by 11 o'clock in the morning of the 16th of April, the first armoured unit gets across, which is the bulk of two RTR. Now, they are thrown across first, not because they're going to Medicina, but because they are going to be the screen. They believe that there may be armoured forces to the south having crossed the river. Yeah. And so they throw the RTR out there who are going to provide a screen for the, the attacking forces facing south, really. So two RTR get across. And then a little bit later, closer to midday or just after uh, the 14th, 20th Hussars with their um, attached Gurkhas in the Kangaroos. Thanks, Paul. Let's follow its route over. So the 14th, 20th now, we're following with our blue uh, lines. They move up towards uh, the line to Crocetta. And then just about one o'clock, they come into action here at a vineyard. We'll talk about that more in a minute. And then following up the action at a vineyard, they continue towards Medicina. That's the main axis. And then just about four o'clock, they reach Medicina. They split into two sort of ad hoc columns, if you like, and they get into the town. I've not shown on there the route of two RTR because they don't actually have to deal with too much. And some of them um, break off from the screening um, function and they join the, the fray in Medicina or at least on, on the outskirts, um, def, you know, providing a bit of mobile firepower and support. So let's get in, in amongst the action. Let's see what happens. So I put a little red dot on there. That was the vineyard where the first action is. It's at about one o'clock. The boys come into contact um, in the vineyards, which are still there today. I'm not saying that the action took place to this exact moment, but along the side of the road, there is a series of these beautiful little vineyards. And Lieutenant Camburn, uh, with it, well, in um, C Squadron, with his Sherman tank, was manoeuvring through, nosing his way through the uh, through the vineyard there. When he came under fire from one of those Stugs, the Italian Stugs, bang, he gets cut, knocked out and uh, starts to burn. His co-driver is um, trapped inside. They can't get him out, and he's burnt to death. Poor chap from Glasgow. Second vehicle goes forward. Sergeant Higginbottom decides to go for sort of right option one, which is the straight up the middle, lots of smoke, lots of noise. Um, he'd, he'd seen that Camburn had been nosing through and got taken out, so he went for the speed and aggression. He really put his foot down and tried racing across through the probably squashing all the uh, the vines as he went. Didn't get too far though. He gets hit by possibly a second one that he hadn't seen. Another of the Stugs could have been an anti tank gun. There's not enough detail in the diaries to know, but anyway, he's hit and and uh, catches fire as well. So that's the second tank gone. A third tank, second Lieutenant Bergham, 
manages to get further uh, using the stealth mode of the Sherman tank, um, gets into position where he's got a sight of one of these stugs uh, by using the cover of one of the farmyard walls. And he's about to give it a flanking shot and knock it out when suddenly he sees a German jump out from behind him with a Panzerfaust, the single throwaway uh, anti-tank weapon, fires it straight into the rear of the of the tank and, and up, up it goes. The third one is, is, is knocked out. Uh, by then, the other tanks are firing HE into the vineyards. The Gurkhas have dismounted and they start infiltrating basically towards the positions and the remaining Germans in, in sight uh, give up. But it's taken them two hours to clear the vineyards. And this is all part of the, you know, superbly well-orchestrated delay in actions. Um, so a two-hour two hour event um, just to get through the vineyard. And then we'll move a little bit closer to the action in the, in the town. So there's a series of these, and you just got to love these paintings. As, a, as a, I've got one upstairs, which is the David Shepherd one of the Bridge Too Far, you know, the bridge at Arnhem, and it, it, it's very evocative. That one's by David Shepherd. This is the Cuneo, uh, Terence Cuneo, the artist. Mm -hmm. And as a kid, I used to love these, and I, I, I still the same. I love all the detail that you can see in them, and we'll talk about the the action in in there in a minute. But needless to say, um, having broken through the vineyard. Um, the the C squadron and uh, the uh, B company of the Gurkhas under um, Major Greenaway, I think it is Greenaway. Um, they 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 push forward to Medicina. They they put the put their foot down, close the last bit of gap, and they ra race forward. Sergeant Hall. Uh, was leading the the charge to get towards the cover of the buildings. I mean, when we say the cover of the buildings, we've got to be aware that the cover was also concealing the Germans inside. But, you know, they didn't want to get taken out by long-distance anti-tank guns, so they wanted to get up closer to the buildings in Sergeant Hall. But he's hit by five uh, five rounds of, of various calibers, but he manages to lurch the, his, his Sherman right to the gates of the, of the town, despite being hit several times, belching smoke before it finally gives up the ghost as he put, puts down his uh, coax machine gun fire in, into the, um, into the first few buildings. And that Sergeant Hall is, is given a, um, uh, a DCM for his actions. When they seen that the that C squadron have uh, the CO sees that C C squadron have lost quite a few tanks already, uh, the nearest support that he can offer is actually regimental headquarters tanks. There's two more, so to those two Shermans from regimental headquarters they get thrown forward to to fill the gaps left by the ones knocked out in the vineyard, and um, we can move on to the the fighting inside now with uh with our next slide where Major Bodger Brown. Um, comes into action. Here he is here, DSOMC with the 14th, 20th. Um, so he's in charge of C Squadron. He's the squadron commander and he's actually leading the way. Um, he puts out over the radio um, the shout of, let's show them, boys, a good old cavalry charge. Get your finger out and follow me. You know, and with that, they they did, and they screamed across the open ground that Sergeant Hall had had, had, had crossed, and he took the uh, the best part of the first part of the, uh, the best squadron with the leading troops straight into um, into Medicina. Uh, he he got the MC earlier on in the campaign, uh, and he gets the DSO in this action. Um, what happens is uh, he leads the the troop in, and overall, I've I've worked it out that it's about fifteen Shermans and 15 of the kangaroos uh, actually enter the town to take the fight on. The bulk of the force, or, or the rest of the force, are encircling the town, getting ready to help out as and when they need. But the force that goes in is about 30 vehicles. Um, he um, goes towards the, the main square, the main piazza, and nudges, the, nudges around the first corner, and he sees one of those self-propelled guns, uh, Semavente, sees another one of those, and it's parked up right in front of one of the large municipal buildings, and it's trying to get a bead on him, and it's still moving alongside the buildings, but his gunner is top-notch, and he pumps in two AP rounds straight into the uh, Semavente before it starts to uh, get a bead on him, and it, it burns furiously, as you can see, 
And in fact, a few minutes later, it actually explodes and, and a lot of the building around it falls down in a you know a huge explosion. Um, it, it falls down and causes all sorts of chaos and dust. Just behind um, Bodger Brown's um, enemy there, the same event behind him there, was two um, 88s. Thank you. And in this picture here, um, the artist is trying to sum up the the action that, that Bodger Brown is involved in. You've got, from the German perspective here, you've got the two 88s, one on either side of the road. They're described as partially in cover, but they clearly weren't, although they're partially in cover, that they're, they're not described as being actually ready to be put into action because um, despite him, he's already destroyed the... Um, the Italian tank, he then enables to drive drive up the street and his machine gunners, coax and uh, the bow gunner, shoot up the crews without them actually getting a shot on him. So I, I, I got a feeling that although they were there, they were perhaps in a hurry to get into position. Maybe they were being repositioned. There had been an air raid. Maybe they'd moved yeah. into the town for cover. I know um, that's, that's an artist's uh, sketch as opposed yeah. to a photograph, but the, the, uh, the legs are still up. Uh, the side legs are still folded yeah. up. Not, yeah. not not down. I mean, I know that that, that could just be the way the artist interpreted artist. it, but it's it, it, yeah. it, 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 interesting, nevertheless. And that's a famous but, image, isn't it? That That is like that, the cover of a commando book or a battle yeah. comic from 1973, isn't it? That's just, that's got boy, boy, a 10 year old boy's interest, that image. Just, you see that and one. A yeah. And a 53 year old bloke. Because yeah, 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 exactly. I'm drawn into it. I don't know about you, but I, I'm drawn drawn to it. And I, I like you. I hadn't spotted that thing about the 88 legs, but I did see that the the wheels are still on, and that they could take the wheels off these, couldn't they? Didn't they take them off? Yeah, and, yeah, they yeah. they flipped up and came off. Yeah, so yes. I only going by my my Britain's 132 scale 88 that had the legs <laughs> folded up at the side. So I, that's I yeah. remember that. But yeah, yeah. So um, yeah. Gets, gets a DSO here because he takes out the Italian vehicle, race it forward. His machine gunners uh, make short work of the of the crew of the 88s. And then um, he, he pushes on with the with his troop, uh, four or five of his Shermans still behind him. And he noses towards the next corner. So he gets past the 88s, noses towards the next corner. Sadly, in, in none of the books do we have a description of what those road names are. So we having been to this ground now we can do some then and nows and what's useful having said that it is an artist impression is we've still got the the use of google but we've got these towers yeah and and from various angles now if you're to visit it you can find those towers and you can find those arch archways which appear on the right of this picture you know they that they do it, it, there's a lot of it that that lines up uh, i think in like most artists impression yeah. they take a few of the characteristics and put it into one picture but needless to say they say that this action takes place on the main square this is the piazza of medicina it's the main it's the main sort of drag if you like and so that's where that action takes place so brown having had that success moves up towards the next corner noses towards round round the corner and to his surprise there's a german a uh, sort of Remy vehicle, a recovery tank, uh, trying to uh, up, uh, pull the right way up, a, an upended German Panther. Um, red Panther in one book and a red uh, a Mark IV in another. We don't know, but anyway, it's busy doing its thing. Probably after the air raid, it, one of the tanks has either been damaged or has slipped into a, um, um, you know, a, a bomb crater and uh, the, the re German Remy in the middle of the battle are trying to upend this, this, this tank. And um, he's about to start dealing with those two when um, a, a German comes out of an alleyway, literally yards away from Bodger Brown's tank with a Panzer Shrek and fires straight into the, the rear of the Sherman. I mean, this is typical close quarter stuff where the infantry can really threaten tanks and this is why the infantry are needed but they're still making their way up so bodger brown's tanks hit um and um one of the guys is, is the troopers in the tank is killed he's badly wounded in the leg another one is burnt in the in the turret and uh, there's only two remaining crew that are sort of uninjured and they're only armed with revolvers uh but that having dragged the, the the major out, the two that are armed with revolvers run across the street, jump on top of the recovery tank with where its hatches are open, and they shout inside and take all the prison, take all the crew prisoner. 
um, and basically stop it doing what it's doing. This is when, though, uh, the, the Gurkhas do arrive. They come through the, the dirt and dust of the collapsing building where the self-repelled gun's blown up. They pass the 88s. And to the relief of Major Brown, um, they then run round the corner and the Panzerschreck guy is seen um, feverishly trying to reload to take on another of the Shermans. And Subadar Gurung raises his kukri and uh, sends him west um, and uh, you know takes him out before he can get a second shot off and, and knock out another of the Shermans. So incredible action going on there. And that, that's for that. That's where Brown is, is awarded the deer. So he himself gets one of the guys to go over and um, before they destroy the recovery tank, he makes sure that they um, see if the radio's working and um they, they he says to leave the engine running if they can because if they can leave it on the on the right channel with the engine running he said we'll be able to mer monitor german radio traffic mm. and they they might not necessarily know that we're doing it you know it's incredibly alert and that's and cool. just, that's forward thinking when you've been through a, a, a uh, through an action like that and seen vehicles blown up oh let's leave the radio on that's that's that yeah I guess that's experience of a combat soldier who now soldier. is kind of performing at peak capacity this peak. You know, they've, yeah they've been doing it a long time they're 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 they know it well maybe not the 14th 20th but they they've as a as a formation that they've, they've honed the skills now yeah yeah really um really forward thinking stuff um and in that piazza um the Colour Sergeant, um, sorry, Company Sergeant Major Long with his um, Sherman um, was awarded a, uh, a medal because, um, sorry, Lieutenant Bailey gets an MC uh, with it, uh, for operating the 50 cal. Um, you know, the kangaroos and the priests had the 50 cows on and he sits in the middle of the piazza and uh, the dismounted troops are basically telling him where they want him to fire. This is one or two of the other Shermans are using their main guns uh, blowing holes into the side of the buildings, allowing the Gurkhas that have now dismounted to do their house clearing. So we've talked about the Hazards a lot, but the, you know, let's get in amongst the buildings. The Gurkhas are going room to room, cellar to cellar. They're even jumping across the rooftops, and they're finding um, you know Germans all over the place, usually in small penny packets, an MG42 and a team, a sniper, a couple of guys. Some of them give them up, some don't. No quarter given. And um, they're trying to stay off in, you know, true, true street fighting tactics. They're trying to stay off the main drags and they're firing the Shermans at, when they're told to, to breach the walls and the Gurkhas are going in. And uh, Lieutenant Bailey uses the 50 cal and he takes out one of the sniper um, guys with, with the 50 cal. Um, come, Sergeant Major Long, the one I did mention, um, he's though hit by one of the snipers when he's standing up in the shur uh, in the turret of the Sherman trying to give directions to the Gurkhas and he's hit they say by a sniper but uh, you know if every guy that was killed by a sniper <laughs> was yeah, killed by a sniper have, it's, it's lone rifle and single rifleman yeah, 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 it's, uh, yeah. single shot um, kill, kills him um, and uh, so the action moved to, to the final part of the town um, as the Gurkhas cleared the, the last buildings and uh, they get to the railway station. And this is just a series of unusual photographs because there is no mention really in this action, certainly from the 14th, 20th, of panther tanks. But here's evidence, if you should need it, of the same tank uh, upended in a way. Yeah. It's sitting in a shell hole. Now, it's described in the history as being right in the middle of the town. But I'm thinking it's almost too much of a coincidence that this photograph shows a panther on the edge of the town, but it's in a in a shell hole, um, and it's it's clearly heavily damaged. But no one actually talks about taking out a panther tank. Um, interesting on the left picture, uh, Paul. If you zoom in, the low left one, um, there's a little brain carrier, and it's, oh, it's yeah, wasp. Yeah. It's the wasp variant with the uh, with fuel the tank, tank on the back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah the big um, the big fuel carrier. So. That's probably taken within a day or so. And, of course, low right, that's the that's the battlefield today. So you can line up that, that yeah. then and now if you were to go there and you'd be able to see where the panther met its maker. Um, so it's an interesting finish. So, yeah, the, the, the station um, saw the last action, really, around the end of the battle. Around 9 o'clock on the evening of the 16th of April, um, some of the troops around the outside, you remember I said they put in an encircling movement, um, they described it as um, putting up hairs. Um, what they saw was uh, Germans running for it, 
when the battle was nearly over and then one by one they would emerge from one of the buildings or from some of the undergrowth in the village and they'd be charging out across trying to break out of the encirclement and uh, and they treated it almost like as a as a hair shoot and they would um, mm. try and take them out as they got away german reinforcements do arrive just before nightfall as as the bell tower rings despite the battle all the way around it at eight o'clock two accounts say the bell rang at eight o'clock um wh whether it's a recording or what i've no idea but I i'm imagining that some some little italian fella at eight o'clock says well i've got to go and do my my business darling i've got to go and ring the bell you know jumping over dismembered bodies and burning shermans and he rings the bell for eight o'clock but um ring it he does but um several tanks no description of what they are are seen on the outskirts of the town approaching medicina around 8 30 and it's thought that that's the start of a, of a counter-attack in true german tactics but it doesn't materialize and they pull back uh, probably a wise move they didn't know how many tanks we had in the town tank v tank is is very costly in the middle of an urban area and and you know discretion and the better part of valor for those armored german armored troops um and they they pull back to to fight another day and that, that's the interesting fact that the germans don't do the counter-attack because i guess by this part of the war we the balance of power is in our favor isn't it they are they are under strength we do outnumber them we do have a bit more strength in depth you know uh, six months early or another campaign they would have just automatically as they always did as always that, James Holland yeah. always said, that pavlovian instinct to, to counter-attack but now counter they're just they're, they're they're running out of resources that they, they, they probably wanted to but they're just they're up against it now um yeah and, big time you know, the fact we can spend troops going through every building the gurkhas going there clearing everything making sure they don't leave pockets behind you that's a luxury we perhaps couldn't have done earlier in the war you know we've, sure. we've now time to double check everything you know and uh it's again a testament to how good we've got at doing these things um too right things considered yeah so yeah, the, the, that's that's the end of the battle within within Medicina. Um, the, the, just to finish the story, the the troops don't move on much from there. Some of them, certainly the ones that were involved in the final assault, stay in the in the town overnight. Others, of course, do move on and start to move towards the next objective, the next part of the slogging match. Um, but there's a lovely description from a guy called um, Trooper Simon, I think it is. I forget his rank. Might have been Corporal, but anyways, from 14th, 20th. And of course, being in the tanks overnight after the battle, they're very much at risk of uh, being uh, shot at. In fact, one German um, attacks the, the tanks in the morning, um, firing at them. Um, he's obviously hidden himself away um, overnight. But yeah, just before dawn, about five o'clock in the morning, um, one of the 14th, 20th Hazars, he's obviously trying to do his bit of uh he's on stag and uh he hears a noise gets his torch out thinking i'm um, being crept up on here by some uh germans turns the torch on and sees six shining little faces um at the side of his tank and they're all gurkhas looking for a cup of tea um but they've all crept up on him and he just sort of says you know they could get that close to my tank without me hearing them he says, I'm really glad that they're on my side and not not, not the enemy because, uh, you know, and, and and that was the thing. They could get a brew off these guys in the Shermans because they had the boiler system, you know. Um, and, and, There's and a that legendary relation story about Gurkhas. And I don't know whether it's one of those legendary ones that isn't true or is true, but I think it was in Burma where when they're going on patrols, allegedly Gurkhas could go up to Japanese and feel that they're Japanese by the lacing of their boots and feel boots. the British, you know, by crawling through the... I don't know whether that's true yeah. or not, but even if it isn't true, the fact that no one discounts it as being, oh, that's impossible, tells yeah. you that these Gurkhas had a reputation for stealth and, and movement, you know, but that, yeah, that's the story. I remember hearing that one as a kid. And, uh, yeah, you know, wow. I've been in, been in Italy with veterans of the Battle Axe Division at Casino, they didn't say exactly that, but they, they said much to say as that trooper had just said there that they were glad they were on our side. They were capable of doing things. They were. They did say that some of them had been known in Casino to, to creep forward and take the ears off Germans, um, you know, yeah. kill them, leave, leave them in situ and come back with an ear. Um, but again, you know, whether it's folklore or not, your, your man, Tim Grung will probably tell you, but they're quite happy for us to have those things because it keeps them high up on a pedestal of, uh, 
troops to have. Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. The whole Falkland Islands reputation, you know, the yeah. once it was the Paras, Marines, and the Gurkhas, suddenly the yeah. Argentinians start losing a bit of faith yeah. in everything, don't they? Yeah. And uh, yeah, so re reputation. I mean, it counts for a lot. Reputation is a, is a, is is something yeah. you have to consider with regards yeah. to these campaigns. Is who are yeah. you facing? Do you know who you're facing? How scared are you of them? Because it affects how you how you react yeah. as a soldier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, in the Great War, they did it then. The Germans actually published a list of every division in, in like a, a Premier League, Championship League 1 and 2, you know, of, of, of who you're going to be up against. So that's why they sent out patrols to find out who the enemy was. Yeah. All right, let's just finish um, the, the, the battle in Italy then. So within, a, within three weeks, the war's over in, in Italy, 2nd and 3rd of May. Um, you know, they break out the, the Po Valley, a major river in the north. Um, very, very, very affluent part of uh, of Italy up there, uh, getting up towards Milan and Venice. Um, out on the right flank, way up to the top of that map, there is Trieste, the Yugoslavian yeah. rebels. Um, sorry, um, partisans. They're they're pushing in that way. They link up with the British Eighth Army, and the Americans are sweeping left towards towards France and up towards Austria. Um, and uh, the surrender goes in on third uh, of May. And that's and the collapse the, of the I, army I group. It, Jules, but did did cause Bologna is important because Bologna is a traffic and rail hub and everything. Yeah. So was the advance on Bologna through the Medicina um, direction? Yeah, that was exactly yeah. after Medicina and, and the Argenta Gap. They bounce on towards Bologna and Modena. Uh, I don't think there's much fighting in the city. I think again, there's not enough troops left to be fortifying those cities. I, I may be wrong. I haven't read yeah. too much well, about that. Well, and, that, and about it connects that. with Damien Lewis again because that was yes, the SAS operation, Operation Tombola, was the uh, the attack that took out the headquarters that was high in the mountains above Moderna. So that was Moderna. when the Germans lose their command, and because Second cool. AS and the Italian fighters are going and kill however many it was German officers there. So there, that's happening at about the same time. You know that, time, that yeah. March, April period. So everything, the Germans, everything is now unraveling. Now it's uh, yeah, it's, oh, it's, massively, yeah. yeah. Um, not only on this front, but on the others as well. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, if we can just look at that, I think we've only got one slide to go. Yeah. Remember, in the, we've zoomed in on Medicinia and, and, and individual Gurkhas and Panzerschrecks, and now we just zoom out to talk about the campaign overall and finish up. The overall uh, strategic objective was to maintain unremitting pressure on German forces to assist favourable conditions for Operation Overlord and that of the eventual entry into southern France. One way of measuring that is by the divisions in use. And as you can see there, the Germans really don't manage to drop the amount of divisions. In fact, by August of 1944 at the Gothic Line, they've actually had to, had to increase the amount of divisions um, involved. So we can say yes yeah we you know did achieve his objectives um you, lots of people will argue well if you'd have used those same 20 odd divisions in france would we have won in any a quicker time again we don't know that's not how it was done it, we did it this way but there was no d-day dodging going on if you ask me uh, you know i've met a lot of the veterans that fought in italy and uh, they're terrific guys that showed as much bravery, dash, courage and valour as anyone on any other front. Um, yeah. And, you know, I'm glad you've done Italy Week, Paul, and hopefully you'll do, you know, more on Italy in the future because it's, a, it's a fantastic campaign. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's definitely a fantastic campaign. A um, little bit about Medicina today. I've been back a few times um, and, and in, well, it was two or three years ago now, I, I went back with the army uh, as a battlefield guide for them. We took them to Medicina. This, uh, the, the guys there are KRH, that's the King's Royal Hussars, who are the descendants of the 14th, 20th Lancers. And Medicina is a battle honour for only two battalions, two regiments. That's the Gurkhas, the six Gurkhas, and now the Gurkhas in general can carry it, and the King's Royal Hussars. And 75 years on and, and so forth, um, this is now um, you know, uh, a celebrated event on the 16th of April. They have a Liberation Day. They have Medicina Day. It, it still goes on. The kids come out. The flags are waved. The Polish um, troops come up and wave. And the Italians, locals are there. And the KRH go, Gurkhas go. And uh, they, we put on a battlefield tour for them. It's a cracking, cracking couple of days up there. 
And Ian, on the wider scale, um, is, is the Italy campaign itself, how is it looked at today? What is there about it? You know, Mussolini, my part in his downfall, um, and Mussolini, his part in my downfall, Spike Milligan, uh, Alan Wicker was there, that famous correspondent, and yeah. his, with, the, with his incredible voice um, last year, or I think it was the year before, um, Gary Lineker, you know, high profile, went to Italy because his granddad fought there. It all helps to raise the profile of a campaign that otherwise um, doesn't get the the plaudits and the attention it really deserves. And, and yeah, a little plug, of course, which I know you, you were very much helping me in support there. We're, we visit Italy uh, once a year, mainly around Casino, because that's where most people want to visit. But battlefield tours to, to Italy are good. Um, that's at the top there. I work with James Holland, who I know you've had on your show. We took uh, troops to Sicily. That's with one Royal Anglian there on a, on a battlefield study. But yeah, up and down Italy, lots of places to explore, you know, and we, we largely get out on the ground on foot because that's the best way to see battlefields. And, and, and Italy is there to be explored. So um, yeah, and, hope and it, it works for you. It's not just the battle side. You just get amazing scenery, isn't it? I mean, you know, some yeah. other places in France and Belgium, the battles are good, but maybe the scenery isn't breathtaking. You know, you, but yeah. Italy, yeah. you've got you've got that kind of evening drinking the vino, looking at fantastic Sun. views of mountains and stuff, and uh, it's 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 an amazing place to go. And I think you're you're right; it's an un underappreciated um, uh, theatre of war. And and it, uh, Spike Milligan's account of it we when we did the spike milligan show back last october november and peter caddick adams was on and, and, and jane milligan we were talking about how peter used spike's account in his book on it, 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 it that's amazing because it was yeah. a book written to be a comedy memoir comedy. but the fact he's he's he's, 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 he's mapping in it was incredibly yeah. accurate it was was good yeah, um, yeah. and and it to fact that you know it, it can serve to to support a military history i think is is amazing and jane his daughter said that he he had a huge archive of military histories he was a real war buff he studied well, warfare yeah. going back to hannibal so he he when he did those books he really wanted to get the military detail correct even yeah. though it was mostly to make people laugh, laugh out of respect for his comrades who fell there and that's the thing isn't it you know i yeah. if if the one thing i'm taking away from from your your brilliant show tonight is is that there's still lives being lost, even as late as April 1945. This idea, the German army is essentially broken, but it's the it's the cornered beast that's no going to die. The, you know, the, what, the most dangerous animal is the, is the wounded predator, isn't it? You know, a yeah, wounded totally. lion. Is, and yeah. that, the Germans can't win now, but they're, they're on the last... It's defending to the last round now, isn't it? The other way, so it's well, what, dangerous. The mindset, dangerous of that, the mindset of that is... You know, they, they knew they couldn't win. They knew that the Russians were knocking on the door of Berlin. They were in Berlin. They knew the Allies were were into Hamburg and places like that, you know, but, and that they were with their backs to the Po and miles from the Austrian border. But yet still they still they were fighting. Incredible. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, some of the first controversial Mega campaign. But, Sorry. Some of the Sorry, Mega veterans I knew, who, who not necessarily from Italy, they also had this sense that if they had given up easily now, because it was easier for them, it would have been it would have been disrespectful to the Falschmager who'd been dying in the previous two years. You know, so you know, although maybe they felt there was a logic to kind of hang on, as soon as we see an Allied soldier, we should really just raise our white flag. You're you're letting down those who've already died. So even if you don't believe in the cause anymore, even if you believe it's lost, you've kind of got to still still go at it the same way as we as the british and the allies would have done yeah. the allies, yeah, yeah. We fought the last even though the bats you know look, look in the early in the war look at singapore look at those things where well, perhaps not singapore is a good example but yeah. where we would you know you, you if you go down too quick easily now you've made everything um yeah before it worthless. before it um worthless so yeah 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 well, I mean, obviously, what a what a cracking way to end the, to end Italy week, Jules. And definitely, I'm um, I'm already thinking next uh, head next year might do an entire Monte Cassino week. I might do a Sicily week. I don't know. There's lots of things. Alex Black about the air power in Sicily is really interesting. He's done a lot of yeah. work on that for Husky. So yeah, um, I'm glad I'm glad actually because as a you know coming from Normandy and living in Normandy, I know people are interested in Normandy, but it's very gratifying to me that people have been interested in Burma week and Italy week because. You know, we do see that focus on Normandy because it's so easy to get to in non-COVID yeah. times and so close to Portsmouth and what have you. So yeah. 
But the fact is, the people out there who are interested in history are interested in all the theatres, as long as it's presented well and presented with um with integrity and information. That I think people are happy. So yeah, it's been great. So um so again, don't forget to contact Battle Honors Tours about going to Italy or either this year or next year or other tours, and because you'll have someone of Jules's caliber and Clive doing these tours and um and and as as good as these programs can be there's nothing quite like actually walking the battlefield and seeing it for yourself it's that it's the it's the it's all the senses isn't it that's the thing about a battle yep. it's the smells the sounds the sights the the the, the 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 ache in your legs when you've walked up a hill to get that <laughs> view that you you can't get when you're just sitting in your armchair reading a history so um yep. i encourage people to get out and see the battlefield so brilliant um I'll just say Cheers, goodbye Paul. to folks. I'll say come back to, to say goodbye to you in a second. But folks, that was it. That was Italy week. It all kicks off again on Monday with Strategic Bombing Week. Don Russell, who works at Virginia Tech, in the uh, I met him through the our study and appreciation of Jimmy Monteith, the Medal of Honor recipient, is coming on to do an amazing story about B seventeen lost over Europe. And then we've got James Jeffries coming on talking about Operation Oyster. Ian W. Tolls coming on talking about B twenty nines and. And um, Tony Redding, who did the fantastic Chindit talk, is coming to talk about the, the bombing of Germany. So lots of great stuff coming up next week. And then after that, we're into pre-D-Day week. Lots of planning and Helen Fry is coming on, talking about the role of Air Mine uh, 9. We've got mine sweeping in the channel. We've got the knocking out of radar and so loads of stuff coming up. So keep checking out the channel. Please consider being a Patreon of us. Uh, share on the social media everything we're doing because we, we, we deserve... The, the guests of this quality deserve a wider audience. But, um, and don't forget to subscribe. But anyway, back to Julian. Uh, thank you very much. Cracking presentation. No problem, I knew it would be a good one to end the week. And um, yeah, and any particular good Pleasure. books about this subject people can read? Uh, if, if people want to know more? Not, I, I want to say, no, not not in the North. Um, Tiger triumphs about the Indian troops. Um and not not too many spend a great deal of time. They all stop at casino rather like most yeah, people's interest. Yeah, even the war diaries you see getting yeah. a bit less expansive. I think even the people yeah. writing down the stuff is like, yeah, the war's going to be over. I can't be bothered anymore. I'm writing these yeah. things out for six months. Yeah, um, yeah. It's there to be written. Just weary. Yeah. Well, there you go. So thanks for having fantastic, me, everybody. Um, I will see you all again next week for strategic bombing. I might do an ask me anything show tomorrow night. I haven't decided yet, but anyway. Thanks, Jules. Thanks, everybody watching. I will see you all again on World War II TV next week. Uh, keep, keep, keep telling people what we're doing here because I think what we're doing is quite important. Thanks, everybody. Have a good evening. I'm off to have a beer. I expect Jules will too. Cheers, everybody.